a friendly reminder, we are recording these meetings. These meetings are made available to the public, so we might have members of the public here, but to, as it stands right now, it seems like we only have task force members, proxy for task force members, OHCS staff, and of course the facilitation team. Um, so welcome to our January meeting uh, of the full task force. Uh, an agenda was sent out and also posted publicly on the task force website. I'm going to go ahead and pull up some slides, uh, but before we do that, I do want to just uh, take a quick roll call and then share my screen with the slides. So I'm just gonna go down the list. Uh, Ariel Nelson. Didn't see Ariel here. Um, Jessica Pratt is called in by phone. Thank you, Paula Hall. Here. Jennifer Parrish Taylor. Hacking away here. Um, Katrina Holland. Uh, Marisa Espinoza. Here. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm, I'm driving. I apologize. No worries. Thank you. Um, Vanessa Timmons. I am here as a proxy for Vanessa. My name is Rowan Schwartz. Thank you. Um, Dolores Martinez. Proxy for Gustavo Morales. Doesn't appear to be here. Uh, Nicole Whitham. That's me. I'm present. Thank you. Alan Evans. Yes, I'm here. Present. Jill Smith. Here. Senator uh, Casey Jama. Senator Dick Anderson. Senator Campos. Present. And Marcus Mundy. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Um, and Mike Thomas, if you can flag um, for me when folks join so that we can make sure we adjust the record, that would be great. Yep. All right. OK, again, so welcome to our January task force meeting. We are going to kind of just do a preview of the agenda for this evening. Um, we'll done a welcome and roll call. We're going to talk briefly about member transitions and an appointment updates um, that the OHCS legislative team has been working through. Then we'll quickly review our group agreements, pivot to uh, the annual homelessness assessment report, which many of you have had an opportunity to already hear about in the subcommittee meeting settings, but you'll actually be able to see the data. Um, we will cover some HB 2100 reforms as that came up uh, as a question in some of the uh, subcommittee meetings. Um, based on the number of attendees, we're not gonna have real formal subcommittee report outs as we've had a number of rotations already. Um, but would like to hear from members about their experiences and discussions on the subcommittee. And then we're going to dive right into uh, open discussion. There are three guided questions uh, to support the facilitation of that conversation, but really want to surface some of the um, differences of opinions and consensus around opinions on how to move forward from here. Reads through this. We'll adjust this as additional members join. Um, so just wanted to note, uh, similar to a few meetings ago, we recognized the service uh, from a previous task force member. Just wanted to do the same for Representative Jack Zika that's no longer with us. Um, for his service, uh, he's transitioned out of the Legislative Assembly and also the task force. So thank you to um, Representative uh, Zika. Uh, we 
thought that we would have Dolores Martinez joining for this evening from U Valkyrie. Um, Dolores is one of two current uh, appointments that are pending in the Legislative Assembly. Uh, so as soon as those are confirmed, we will have additional voting members, uh, both from one from U Valkyrie and um, also Maria from Latino Network. Gentle reminder of our group agreements. We do plan on having some discussions uh, later on towards the latter half of the meeting. Um, these are we're dusting these off from um, past meetings uh, where we have agreed to give grace and forgiveness. Make sure that we're taking good care. Manage your own boundaries. Uh, be thoughtful and compassionate. We want folks to take space and make space openly share and support your colleagues and fellow task force members as they may openly share experiences. Um, don't be afraid to engage in lively conversation, even if it may feel awkward. Uh, and our WAIT acronym, does it need to be said? Does it need to be said by me? Does it need to be said by me right now? Just as a way to make sure that we are sharing space and um, that we have the collective voices in the room to contribute to tonight's conversation. All right, so we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about the recent annual homelessness assessment report to Congress. Um, also in our field, it's called the AHAR report. Um, just for a little bit of background context, the data that we're going to be looking at uh, is a culmination. Um, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, works with one of our actually TA uh, cross firm partners, APT Associates. Um, and they do a really deep analysis of all of the point in time data, um, the estimates that give us a snapshot of homelessness on a single night. Um, this is an enumeration that's comparable to the census, but it's really focused on people experiencing both sheltered and unsheltered homelessness. Um, most communities conduct a point in time count at the continuum of care level. Um, so you all would have had eight COCs throughout the state that um, generally, somewhere in January, uh, possibly February or March, there were a number of waivers granted for specific communities to conduct these counts. Full disclaimer, um, just like the census is not a perfect methodology or a, you know, a perfect count, it is very much an estimate. The same is true of the point in time count. Um, and we know we'll see in a moment that for Oregon, some of these numbers are likely an underestimate. So first up, um, this just gives you a visualization of how Oregon uh, compares to the rest of the country in a numerical sense. Uh, so for the 2022 point in time count, uh, the state totaled 17,959 individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, the darker blue means the more number of people experiencing homelessness per 10,000 people, um, the lighter shades of, of blue indicate a lower number per 10,000 people. Uh, so first up in this chart, this is looking at the largest changes in homelessness by state, um, both over a two year period from 2020 to 2022. So sort of the onset of the pandemic um, point in time counts would have happened right before that had actually emerged as a pandemic um, up into 2022. Uh, on the left hand column and then on the right hand column that looks at a more longitudinal period of time. Um, and if you see Oregon is highlighted there as being one of the uh, top five largest increases in the country. Um, now there you will find throughout all of these charts that there are some notes that um, just kind of provide some additional context about Methodology, uh, methodology changes for certain communities uh, resulting in exclusion from the lists uh, and or exclusion of Puerto Rico and U.S. territory. So you won't see comparison points for um, Puerto Rico and places like Guam, American Samoa uh, and U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, so within that top five, you can see both the number um, of the, the increase, which is about 3,300, as well as the percentage, which landed at about 22.5%. Uh, 
Um, so not the highest increase, either numerically or percentage wise, but still top five out of uh, the entire country, top five states out of the entire country. Next up, um, this next exhibit shows that uh, Oregon also made top five states with the highest percentage of people experiencing homelessness who are unsheltered. So out of that whole sum of people experiencing homelessness in the state of Oregon, uh, roughly almost 62% of them are experiencing homelessness outdoors in outdoor settings. So more than half of the population, um, pretty high up there in terms of a numerical value, but also a statistical value. Um, another exhibit on your screen there is focusing on the largest changes in the number of individuals experiencing homelessness. So the AHAR data really looks at both familial homelessness or families experiencing homelessness, particularly families with children, um, but also the number of individuals. And this chart here focuses on um, the increase in individual homelessness. Uh, Oregon had a 21.6% increase in terms of the uh, 2020 to 2022 period of time. Um, additionally, there was also a representation in the longitudinal change. So from 2007 to 2022, um, that number had also creased, increased um, by about 47%, uh, almost 48%. Another chart here really looks at the different types of communities that do this point in time count um, and in almost every category. So for the largely, um, excuse me, for the other largely urban COCs, we had representation from Eugene, Springfield and Lane County. Um, and this was specifically related to the uh, largest numbers of individuals experiencing chronic homelessness. Um, and we also had the Oregon balance of state, which uh, factored in under a largely rural commu uh, commu uh, continuum of care. And for you, those of you that aren't familiar with the way that HUD um, has communities define chronic homelessness, it means that they've both uh, experienced either a number of episodes in a shorter period of time, um, or continuous and ongoing homelessness for a specific period of time, and they have a, a disabling condition. Um, so it's kind of a, a twofold definition. They have to have the length of time experiencing homelessness, and they also have, a, have to have a disabling condition um, to meet the criteria of chronic homelessness. One thing I also forgot to mention, um, major cities made the list. Portland, Gresham, Multnomah County were also featured uh, as a major city COC. So three out of the four types of COCs, uh, Oregon had representation. Um, in terms, this kind of relates to that uh, slide that I just shared a moment ago, but in terms of the largest changes in number of individuals experiencing chronic patterns of homelessness, um, Oregon was represented both in the two year period of time, so that 2020 to 2022, um, second only to the state of California, uh, both numerically, um, but certainly leading um, only second to Nevada in the percentage increase. Um, also making the list on the change from 2007 to 2002. So a whole lot of representation on the increase side, um, not a lot of representation in this report on the decrease side, although there were some um, positive attributes around un unaccompanied minors um, in the state of Oregon, as well as uh, like a longitudinal decrease in family homelessness. Um, this is another uh, category uh, as being Oregon was one of the, it was actually the highest rate of people and families with children who are unsheltered. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of leave us um, on the AHAR data present out with that piece because we've got almost 60% of families uh, who are experiencing homelessness that are sleeping outdoors. 
Um, and I think that's pretty sobering to know that uh, statewide, we've got children that don't have access to a place to call home. Um, and uh, Jennifer, I think, and maybe a couple of other task force members did inquire about some of the demographic breakdown um, of this data. Uh, the team is working to uh, distill that and to pull together all of the demographic information. So we will have information for the task force on the rates of disparity, um, but we also want to do some comparison to the poverty numbers and some of that really rich census data. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment so that we can field any questions before we move on to the next topic. Uh, I realize that not all of this information is new to you all because we have discussed it in the subcommittee setting, but we did not have the benefit of actually having a chance to see um, the, the charts there. Are there any questions? I, I do have one question is, um, is houselessness, um, uh, is a person considered homeless in a, in a shelter? Yes. Yeah, so, if it's an unsheltered people, is unsheltered in an outdoor setting, meaning shelters itself. So for unsheltered, that means, um, and of course, for the point in time methodology, um, HUD is pretty prescriptive on who can be counted versus who can't be counted. So this count does not include families that might be doubled up or couch surfing. Um, these data only include folks that are in an emergency shelter, uh, whether it be for families or single adults, whether it be a hypothermia shelter bed that, ex you know, where you have uh, expanded capacity in the wintertime or whether it's considered a year round shelter. It also it also counts folks that are actually outdoors. So that can mean um, any type of place not meant for human habitation, a park bench, outdoors in a tent or in an encampment setting, um, out sleeping in front of a church, sleeping in front of a business. Those folks would be uh, categorized as experiencing unsheltered homelessness, which would I don't know how that would line up with the definition of unhoused because that's used interchangeably for both folks experiencing sheltered and unsheltered homelessness, depending on the jurisdiction. Um, but this count definitely looks at folks who are in shelter. So shelters have to report those numbers um, up in, into their COC, as well as folks that go out into the community based on their specific um, methods of counting people it will look very different in places like the rock um, where there's this vast geography that you know you, you, you've got to kind of work with your resources and um, manpower or woman power people power i should say uh, and then you also have communities that do this like with their eyes closed because they've done it and they've got it narrowed down and they really do get close to um, counting almost everybody in their community. But yes, great question, Alan. And this is definitely reflective of um, both shelter, emergency shelter and unsheltered individuals. The only caveat I will say is that there's possible that within a specific uh, region or jurisdiction, there are shelters or people, faith-based groups, mutual aid groups that take in people um, that don't know anything about a COC. They may not have made a connection um, and they do this regularly. If they don't know about it, they're not count. So when we say that this is an estimate, it truly is an estimate. Um, we know that it's likely an underestimate in most communities throughout the country. Um, and seven to almost 18,000 people is still a really uh, high number. And the, the, the increases are definitely cause for concern. Jennifer? Um, will there be any analysis of the cities that had a dramatic reduction in their counts and see you know, what they've done differently that might speak to why they had a reduction? meaning less people who are uh, unhoused? Um, that's a really great question. Um, 
That's a really great question. And I'm quickly pulling up the Excel sheet that the team is working through. Uh, we are doing a COC by COC comparison in our analysis and uh, really getting pretty granular with census data and also the point in time data with a pretty explicit focus on race and ethnicity. Um, it's really, here's the thing, data is great. Lots of numbers are great. The better data quality that you have is excellent. And the reality is it's an incomplete picture. Um, and the reason being is we, we often do these enumerations, um, but we don't spend time hearing or learning about the human experience and what their stories and, you know, what their stories um, and access to the system or lack of access to the systems are. So it's a really incomplete picture. And I would I would caution us to draw any conclusions other than the obvious around the increases. Um, we've got anecdotal evidence, COVID hit, people lost jobs, there's no, you know, limited access to behavioral health care. Um, the eviction moratoriums were great, and some people fell through the cracks, and we don't have all of their stories. I would just say that we can explore that data, Jennifer, um, but we really, we really want to get some good qualitative data to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reason I was asking is I'm just wondering if there are learnings and the difference to see if there are things that other states are doing to address this issue that we currently don't do that we could learn from to maybe uh, try here to uh, address our circumstance. Noted, and Mike Thomas, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I was hyper focused on Oregon data specifically um, for the purposes of reviewing the AHAR. Um, we are connected to a number of communities throughout the country, um, some of which have experienced decreases in homelessness. I, I guess I'll answer this with a little bit of a question. Um, we have brought forward information and evidence about reductions in homelessness to the task force before. And it usually gets qualified with the differences of that geography. So whether it's Virginia or California, um, there seems to be a little bit of uh, hesitancy to apply strategies that have been proven in other communities because of the uniqueness of the state of Oregon. Um, so I would love to, to bring more examples to you. And I want to make sure that um, I'm contextualizing those examples with the fact that, yes, there are different features uh, across these communities, but there are some really proven strategies that work. Um, we could definitely do that for the February meeting, if that's helpful. I would and really I love that. Okay, Nicole, thank you. All right, just like an end up here. Um, and welcome, Dolores and Maria were both able to join us. So welcome uh, for you all coming. Dolores, I gave a brief background about you um, being a proxy and having a pending appointment. Did you wanna come off mute and on camera to introduce yourself for just a moment? I know this is your first task force meeting. Sure. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dolores Martinez. I'm the director of community engagement with Iwakri. It's nice to meet everyone. <laughs> Welcome, glad Thank to you. have you. Um, before we move on to some of the HB 2100 reforms, are there any other data related questions? Check the chat out. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull this back up.
So one of the things that came up at a subcommittee meeting um, was around like what actually changed with uh, HB 2100. Uh, and I wanted to just share, oh, sorry. Just share a little bit about the reforms part. Um, and I think we've got some folks from OHCS on the line as well today. Feel free to jump in and, and weigh in as well. Um, we know that there were some statute changes. Uh, there was actually, oh no, there was actually some statute changes that um, really helped distinguish federal anti-poverty programs from homelessness assistance resources. There was the expansion of the pool of partners that could actually provide advice to both uh, OHCS and the um, Housing Stability Council, um, specifically advice and consultation. Uh, historically, only um, the Community Action Agency Network via CAPO had the uh, authority, ex like explicit authority, to provide um, that advice. But really, when it is boiled down to the nuts and bolts of some of the HB 2100 reforms, um, it really defined culturally specific organization as well as culturally responsive organization at a high level. Um, also culturally responsive services. Um, and it gave the authority to OHCS in partnership with culturally specific organizations to further flesh that definition out. So that was one of the directives coming out of there. Um, it also confirmed, um, I just mentioned this a second ago, but want to reiterate, it confirmed the roles um, and really clarified the roles in administering federal anti-poverty programs um, as being separate and apart from uh, state homeless assistance dollars. Um, it also codified the state or the SHAP program, the State Homelessness Assistance Program, um, as programs under emergency housing accounts, and also made a confirmation around um, being outcome oriented and outcome focused. Um, just going to reiterate, it did the expansion of not only the um, advice and consultation to other partners, but it also looked at um, expanding partnerships that would actually work with OHCS to address uh, and end homelessness, um, bringing in more diverse perspectives. Uh, there was, I think the intent and the spirit of it was also to recognize local planning processes that were needed for successful homeless services, um, which included integration with culturally specific providers. And I think the, the big takeaway from there is that what's happening, um, our homelessness experience in the Rock might not be resolved in a way that homelessness in Portland Multnomah um, would be addressed because those are two very different areas of the state that really require um, that local planning, that nuance, um, and, and a system that is designed by the folks on the ground in those communities. So, for example, the state can't say like, hey, we want you to apply this blanket strategy to address homelessness statewide because that wouldn't work. Um, the last piece uh, that it also changed in statute was providing OHCS the ability to administer federal programs with the advice of the Housing Stability Council. Um, so those were some of the key statutory updates and I would just invite Mike or folks uh, from OHCS on the line to provide any context uh, any additional context that I might have missed. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in really quick. Uh, Mary Francis, that was a really good update. I would say, um, you know, one of one of the outcomes over the last year um, that I, you know, I just reflect on um, that House Bill 2100 assisted us with was really related to um, being able to go into some other networks and start partnerships with new organizations. Um, so like the the reforms piece, I think have helped us prepare to think about like working across different connections. So like this year we've gotten partnerships with the nine tri federally recognized tribes of Oregon and we've made partnerships with navigation centers and project turnkey groups and um, eviction prevention uh, uh, supports. So like 
I think the the you know maybe one message here is like the reforms that allowed us to start to think about working in different networks and across different systems are in are helping now. Like they're actually supporting us with you know the the work that we're doing, the new resources that we've that have come in to start to think about designing other interventions across the systems. Um, so I think that's one piece that I would mention. Um, there's still definitely a lot of work to do as well, right? Like some of the pieces around outcomes oriented contracting and defining better culturally specific services and sort of the, the landscape and piece of that work. Like that is still very much um, something that we're, we're uh, eager to engage more with you all in to hear more about sort of ideas and thoughts around what those look like. But um, I think one message is just like we are we are definitely implementing changes as we're going um, and we're still looking forward to sort of engaging in some of the bigger system change discussions with you all. Awesome, thank you for that, Mike. The last piece that I will add around the um, sort of outcomes orientation, uh, the explicit direction in the HB 2100 language is for these performance standards for grantees um, to be established that really focus on um, providing access to state dollars to address racial and ethnic disparities. So that charge is in there as well. Um, how, when and how those performance standards are developed. Um, I think Jennifer, I've heard you and Katrina talk about the data um, and the need to really um, take an, like an equity approach in the data and the performance management um, as those are, are developed to, to make sure that there are no unintended consequences and to make sure that what is being designed actually um, contributes to a reduction in the disparities. So looking forward to um, being able to provide you with an analysis of where the um, disparities surfaced uh, in comparison to last year's um, disparities analysis that we did. Uh, and we will be talking about a timeline of when you can expect that uh, towards the end of today's meeting. Not going to spend too much time on the reforms piece or really feel many questions because there's going to be a lot of opportunity towards the last half of our meeting for you all to have some of those discussions. Um, but we can actually talk a little bit. You can get started talking now um, about subcommittee report outs and you all don't have like an official designee. Not everyone has been able to attend every meeting. Um, but from a facilitation team standpoint, I think we've been really excited and energized by the conversations that are being had at the subcommittee meetings, some of the ideas that are being generated, um, recommendations that we've been able to start to craft. Um, and I would just love to hear from task force members about their perspectives, about what they're hearing. Uh, and before I kind of open up the floor, just want to give folks a reminder of the rotating subcommittee structure that we've had. Um, to date, y'all have gone through two different rotations um, where you kind of move along with your assigned cohort and you've had an opportunity to spend a lot of time hearing from uh, staff at OHCS about the current funding structure and current contracting process and eligibility. Um, but you've, you've also had a, a chance to really engage in, I won't call them deliberations, but just thought partnership and idea generation and um, really sharing the range of perspectives that each of you bring. So we've been focused on changing the funding structure, modifying contracting process and eligibility, um, and then funding of services solutioning. And we've even talked about the external factors to OHCS um, that they don't have any control over. ODOJ, DAS, um, the Legislative Assembly, and all of these other factors that come in. So I'm gonna pull these, um, I'm gonna pull these down for just a, for probably the rest of the meeting until it's towards the end uh, so that we can just have a conversation um, and hear from one another. Alan, what say you? You look like you're ready. You look like you're ready to rock and roll. <laughs> um, I, I've enjoyed all the conversations. I've enjoyed every one of the subcommittee um, meetings 
and a conversation around everything that has to do with homelessness and the services provided. Um, I would like to see, you know, we're, we're a rare organization in the state of Oregon. Um, we serve a lot of people. Um, we're, we're opening up, well, we've got one big navigation center open and we're opening up multiple in communities. Um, we, we don't reach uh, SHAP dollars or EHA dollars um, in, in those communities. The, the community action agencies have the ability to either give us the opportunity to apply for them or not. Um, we've got a, a budget that comes out to about $25 a day per person. And um, having access to being able to, to apply directly from the state uh, for support for organizations like ours, because portions of our organization run outside of, we assist people with a higher barrier program, even though we do have low barrier emergency shelter at each one of our facilities. Um, I would like to see personally the ability to have an open access to apply for support, um, especially when we're serving over 600 people in the state, um, and, and, and be able to have an even playing field for longer term sustainability for a vital program that we're providing. There is no access to funding for higher barrier programs that assist people in changing their lives. Um, it's not a competitive place for us to apply to. And, and I think everybody here understands that. Um, we can get emergency shelter housing in communities, um, but when we start talking about longer term pro outcomes for people, um, you know, we're seeing an increased uh, number of senior citizens and mothers with children. Um, you know, we're at 56% of the people coming through our door have it, it issues with addiction. Um, and 44% of them don't and need a safe place to land. Um, I, I would like to see us have an opportunity, you know, we're, we're kind of getting the crumbs um, in communities where we do receive it. Um, and it, it's, it's frustrating after 21 years of providing a service to be offered just a little bit and then that gets sucked up into collecting data and data entry and then those dollars not reaching the vital services we need to provide in the communities. So I personally would like to see a recommendation go that will level that playing field for organizations like ours that provide services in multiple counties in Oregon. And the only way we can apply for dollars right now is through a community action agency that will give us a small portion of what they receive in that community. That's, that's what I would like to see personally. Thank you for that, Alan. Who else wants to share their perspective and how the conversations have been going um, in the subcommittees? I can jump in. Um, um, I can share if folks. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Marisa, go ahead. I'm so sorry. <laughs> OK, if you're sure. Um, yeah, sorry to be off camera. I'm, I'm not driving out, but I am in a car, so <laughs> better to just do audio. Um, yeah, and um, I appreciate Alan starting the conversation off. I'll try to be brief, but I just wanted to um, bring in some thoughts. You know, I, I think the subcommittee um, conversations have been especially rich, I feel like, in the last couple um, sessions. I feel like, you know, we've kind of generated a bit more um, just discussion and like specificity. Um, and I know there's still more room to go, more more to come with that. But, um, you know, I think one of the things that I found maybe challenging, and I think I've aired this in the group too, but um, it's just thinking about, you know, how to continue um, really looking uh, in a focused way at racial disparities and how, you know, we've had a lot of discussions around technical challenges and like system fragmentation and, you know, delays in um, services and funding in ways that like, you know certain types of um fixes to infrastructure and like funding could um also pose you know ethical considerations because they really delay um you know that that work on the ground and they delay that you know often life sustaining or even life life saving service but at the same time you know i feel like that needs to continually be 
um, framed in, through the lens of, you know, the work that we're tasked to do with, um, you know, reducing racial disparities. And so I think, you know, um, in our last discussion, I feel like, you know, folks kind of brought back in that language around targeted universalism. And I, I think it might be helpful to kind of revisit that um, and, you know, just kind of be a little bit more um, disciplined in, you know, recognizing that when we do have these areas of frustration and challenges that impact um, individual organizations or, you know, kind of groups of organizations that we, you know, kind of refer back to some of the early work that was done in the initial report and findings around, you know, power mapping and um, that we try to still land on a place where, you know, w which the targeted universalism approach would um, define as, you know, really focusing in on populations that have been systemically excluded or exploited um, and in that way, actually addressing better outcomes for everyone. So I just, I wanted to bring that back in because I know it's one of those, um, you know, kind of even just like organizational culture type of learnings, like it takes time to really adopt that and feel like a sense of fluency and how to navigate these discussions. Um, but I really want to make sure that we are bringing that in and, um, you know, especially as we get closer to, to specific recommendations. Thank you for that. And just for folks not tracking the chat or dialed in by phone, I did um, I'll read this definition really quickly, um, but I did drop in the chat a what targeted universalism is. It's not something that's big or scary. It is a, a framework where universal goals are established for all groups concerned. So that would be everyone experiencing homelessness, regardless of their identities. Um, in the state of Oregon, and that framework then uses a targeted process and strategies to achieve those goals. Um, and it really spends some time looking at the barriers specific to a subpopulation. So um, if I'm going to use veterans, if you're looking at veterans, you use a specific strategy for veterans. If you're looking at families with children, specific strategies for families for children, same for youth and young adults. Um, and that would actually translate over to specific racial or ethnic groups. Um, folks with disabilities might need their own targeted set of strategies, um, and you might even get more granular. You might have folks with physical disabilities and folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities or folks with a uh, behavioral health component there. And um, you're really looking at how different groups are situated within structures, cultures, and across geographies uh, to obtain that universal goal. So again, something I said earlier, um, about the comparison between The Rock and Portland Multnomah, those are two very different geographies. So even for folks with disabilities in The Rock, their strategies in a targeted universalism framework might not mirror that for folks that are in Portland because there's greater access to transportation. Um, there's a higher saturation of service provision. Um, there's, you know, different, different things that present in a local jurisdiction that dictate the need to make sure that these strategies are targeted for those specific groups. Um, and it goes on to talk about um, communication and public marketing and being really inclusive and bridging um, as opposed to you, you don't in a targeted universalism framework, you don't pit groups one and pit groups against one another. Um, you really are focused on all groups achieving that universal goal. And yes, Joe's question in the chat, are there best practices that have worked in communities that have embraced targeted universalism? And will I bring some examples to share? Yes, I will bring some examples to share. Um, and there are quite a few communities that are embracing a targeted universalism framework to address homelessness specifically. Um, also a pretty popular framework that the um, that you'll see in the education field um, that's been working on racial equity for, you know, pretty substantially longer period than the um, homelessness field. So I'll, I'll try to bring a variety of examples. Jennifer, I think you had the floor next. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm mulling over what I want to say. Um, so forgive me if this is disjointed. Um, one, I really want to echo what Marisa said. I want to echo what Alan said. I think for me as someone that uh, is not a direct service provider yet works for an organization that provides that service, um, what I've learned through our conversations is it feels like the current system that we have is not set up for innovation. It is not set up for, it almost feels like it's working against itself to achieve the goals that it's set out to do. Um, and I feel, not I feel, it, yeah, I feel like the current model also has benefited some groups over others who are providing services. Um, and I think there is a tension that I felt, at least in the larger uh, group discussions around this or around seeking to change the structure um, in a way that might shift uh, who the beneficiaries are. Um, and I, I think, struggle at times with how to continue to have the conversation when it doesn't necessarily feel that folks are coming to the discussion um, as good faith actors, um, that the conversation becomes personal for folks, um, it becomes about them and not necessarily the work that we're doing, which shifts our focus from getting the work done. Um, and I guess I, what I would just ask or challenge myself, and maybe I'm making assumptions, but also um, we're here because this is the experience of folks who are seeking services and we have to listen to what they're what they've said. Um, and if that is different than from your own experience, that's fine, but it's not any less valid. And so I would just ask folks to put their personal um, feelings aside and how can we really seize this opportunity to do some transformational systemic change um, that'll benefit everyone, uh, but it, it, it may look different than how we're currently doing the work. Um, so I know that was a bit rambly, uh, so forgive me, but that's kind of what I've been thinking about. Thank you, Jennifer. And we're actually, one of our guided questions is going to kind of dive directly into that um, in a moment. I'll get Jill first, and then I'll um, kind of start talking through some of the questions. Jill? Um, I, I, Jennifer inspired me to say a couple of things. Um, I just think for me, the numbers we just reviewed at the beginning um, just speak for themselves. We we are here uh, to, to end homelessness and we're not doing that job right, obviously, because our numbers are going the wrong way. And so I just feel like we have to do something different. And having been working for government or government funded agencies for over 30 years. It's always been about doing everything the same, being fair and consistent and, you know, treating everyone exactly alike. And it doesn't work. Um, people are different with different needs. And I, I love the concept of targeted universalism and reaching people based on their own personal needs and where they're comfortable, who they're comfortable interacting with. So I just have a strong desire to learn more about that and to change these numbers. Um, and I really hope that we can move away from this being personal um, and be open to doing things differently. Um, just it's heartbreaking to me to to hear about you know, the numbers are just heartbreaking. So that, that I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Jill, for that. Um, and I do want to pause just to say this. The numbers are definitely sobering. Um, and there are communities that are decreasing their numbers. And we've had an opportunity to see this in some really big ways. Um, I know uh, for 
Atlanta is a community that I often draw on. We did one of their first housing surges uh, that were pandemic related and they got 790 people housed. Um, they're working on their next goal of 1500 right now. So it, it's achievable, it's attainable. Um, but one sort of common theme that I've heard from every single task force member is uh, around the, the size of the pie, right? The pie, it needs to be increased. And if you go back to the report um, that was submitted last year around this time, actually to the Legislative Assembly, in that problem statement that y'all developed, um, there were three parts to it. And one of those parts was around having inadequate resources. Um, and we will have, I promise we'll have a chance, y'all will have a chance to look at some of the recommendations language um, in advance of, of the February task force meeting um, to really have a chance to sit with the language that has been distilled and so the size from these subcommittee meetings and transcripts and recordings. Um, as your neutral third party facilitator, resources are an issue in the state and y'all could definitely use some more to tackle homelessness. Um, and that is statewide from corner to corner. Um, let's, let's think about putting that ask in the atmosphere. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with one of our first questions for tonight um, in the spirit of talking about setting personal differences to the side. Um, I think we heard from Alan some of his pain points, but I would love to know, like, what are your pain points about these changes that need to happen? Um, where's their alignment and how do we reach common ground why remain, while we remain focused on reducing racial disparities and homelessness, which kind of speaks to um, Marisa's, Marisa's point and Jennifer's point. Let's talk about what's like keeping you up about these meetings at nighttime um, and, and about the work. I can go first. Um, I'm just worried about not putting any more work on the people who are providing services because we're looking at a lot of big changes and changes always mean more work. And uh, I just really am concerned about whatever changes we make, not, I don't know, putting a bigger burden on those that are really doing the hard work on the ground anyway. Thanks for that, Nicole. Marisa? Yeah, um, I guess, so I, I know I've talked about this in our subcommittee recently, but, um, and maybe more than once um, in the spirit of just kind of not taking things personally, but, you know, being open and clear. I, I think I really um, continue to worry about um, structural changes that perpetuate a power imbalance um, between more established organizations and emerging organizations in ways that, that can actually be paternalistic um, and reinforce, you know, structural um, power imbalances that we that we know reflect, you know, bigger systems in the outside world. Um, I think that's something that, you know, it's, it's close to my heart without it being something that, you know, I necessarily bring um, from my service provision experience, because as I've said before, um, I work for a white led, you know, dominant culture organization. But what I do know is that, um, you know, you know, even since I began doing this work, there have been a number of um, new organizations in the area where I work led by people of color, um, brimming with solutions, brimming with leadership and not supported in the way that they should be to lead um, solutions in their communities. And um, that really bothers me. And the other reason why that bothers me is because, um, you know, we're doing human service work or social work or whatever you wanna call it. And the reality is that we do have a long history in this industry of that type of power dynamic as well, of paternalism, you know, making decisions for people and not with people. 
um, imposing different types of really traumatic sometimes changes for people um, or policies that are actually very in inequitable or unjust. Um, that is our legacy. As, <laughs> at the same time, it's a legacy of helping people, saving lives, housing people, et cetera. And I think that we kind of need to hold that more because um, one thing that is always a concern to me is, you know, when we are in a position of power, but also presume benevolence, um, there, there can actually be some really negative outcomes if we don't, you know, self-interrogate and be open to, uh, you know, a critical look at the way we do things, which, you know, should always be evolving. So, um, yeah, that's my two cents on the pain point. I, I hope that kind of <laughs> answered that question. Thank you for that. Um, other folks, other thoughts and opinions? Um, I am going to kind of put a filler out there. Um, I didn't see anyone come off mute or raise their hand. Uh, so I want to go back to Alan, what you were talking about a little bit earlier around direct access to funding um, and having to go through community action agencies. Have you all thought about competitive funding versus just good old fashioned formula funding? Or have you thought about set asides? Like, for example, Alan, what would it, what type of funding, or what percentage of allocation would your organization and other organizations that are in a similar position that have both the high barrier and low barrier program? Um, and I'm gonna qualify that question with like, from a professional perspective, I love everything about Housing First, and I recognize the need for participant choice, even if that means that some participants are going to want for their own safety, security, recovery, sobriety, whatever the case may be, uh, an alternative pathway um, that doesn't necessarily trigger them, re-traumatize them, or support the direction that they are choosing to go uh, forward within their life. Um, and I think the two can coexist. So yeah. if you could just give a sense of, have you thought through the idea of set aside or percentages for organizations like yourself? Because I think we really need to start having that conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you wanna kick us off, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, um, I, I don't know if, I think a competitive uh, opportunity for funding would be great. Um, you know, there needs to be accountability. There needs to be these important things. The services need to be provided. Um, I, I'm not really eloquent because, you know, I come from that side. I don't have an education or anything else, but I do know that everybody has a story. And um, when, when we don't have access to funding for allowing people to make the choice to change, and support them in that place, then everybody gets pushed into the the bigger pile. Um, and you know, I, I think that having the ability to apply for services to help people change their life would be a great thing. I mean, we we and and I know multiple organizations in the state of Oregon. There's one that's been providing services for 70 years that for the the safety or model I don't want to say safer model but the people who choose recovery and choose to get help to overcome the obstacles they face to be sustainable in the community still struggle for sustainability there and we would like to see an opportunity for you know and we provide both so ours are full navigation centers with emergency shelter that's low barrier and if they're not a fit for our longer term reentry program um which is a higher barrier model that's surrounded around that's based around recovery we still navigate people to resources um 
in, in the communities, but the reentry program for us, we've probably got about 200 plus 250 people in reentry now. Um, they still need support. And that's been the hardest thing for us to get funding for long, you know, sustainable funding for our organization. And if we could have the ability to, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, in Clatsop County, nine years ago, they offered us $12,000 to assist us in assisting people. Um, and we spent $18,000 on data entry that year. We were the largest provider in shelter in another county in our community. And we fought for an increase, uh, $30 million increase in CHAP and EHA that year. That happened. And we were never allowed to apply for any of it because the Community Action Agency didn't give us the ability to apply for that assistance. That's frustrating to us when we serve multiple communities. Um, I just think that there needs to be an opportunity outside of the COC or the CAAs to be able to have a competitive opportunity to apply for funds for the way we've been providing services for 20 years. And it's a proven model that works. Um, I, I think it's unfair for that program to be at risk. Um, and then people have to, who are choosing recovery, have to be sitting in the same room or, or sitting in the same environment with everybody that is that's using. Um, and that was my story. Um, I, I wanted help. I wanted true help. I couldn't afford to get true help. I just couldn't. And the agencies that were there to provide that help had to had to continually go out and raise money through private donors to provide that service. And um, I think it's it's terrible that you have to be on fire to receive assistance in the state of Oregon, and that people shouldn't be pushed into an environment to catch on fire to receive help. Um, if you look at our numbers in our state, it's devastating. It, it's it's devastating to even witness to try to provide services in a community that don't support the opportunity for people to have recovery-based reentry programs. Um, if there's no dollars out there, I, I would like to see us have uh, uh, the ability to apply um, for something that would help a person making those steps assist them so we're never at risk of having to close down programs because they're not low barrier um, or housing first models. I don't know if that explained it, but um, I spent over two decades on the streets, lived through trauma, lived through stuff, chose self-medication because it was the easiest way to change my life and to not feel. And then when I finally got to the point where I wanted recovery and an opportunity, there's, there wasn't an act opportunity for me to do that. I had to get arrested to get rescued. And, you know, where we based our organization, building this organization off of the fact that there are people who truly want recovery and we're getting more people who've never even done drugs in our organization. And for a 62 year old man who had his toe cut off, who lost everything and got kicked out of his apartment to come to our door um, or have to go to a shelter where there's active drug abuse and abuse, um, just it doesn't seem right to me. And we don't support that in the state of Oregon. I'd like to see the opportunity for us to be able to apply for money to help that population of people and not put them at risk. We've seen a 9% increase in domestic violence during the pandemic. Um, and we had women and children showing up at our doors, wanted that assistance, and we're trying to figure out how to continue to provide those kind of programs in the state of Oregon with no access to funding. And, and we, we've made some milestones, and Mike, you know this, this last year, we've really made some milestones in doing it, but even when we were approved for a sum of money for navigation. Um, it took us almost two years to get that funding, and we had to spend and raise money to pay those bills to receive that funds to go on to what somebody else was talking about. 
and um, it's it, it has its moments of frustration, and that's kind of why I'm here. I want to bring some equality there because I don't think that that Dan, I'll say it by name, um, who's been with us now for 14 months, and we're trying to put together a reentry plan for a senior on a fixed income that can't make it out there, and who has disability issues, um, who's afraid and fragile. Um, I would hate to see programs end because of lack of funding in our state, and this person be pushed into a situation where survival is really tough for senior citizens. Thank you for that, Alan. Uh, Katrina, you've got your hand up, and then Mike, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Katrina, if you're speaking. I'm so glad you said something because I'm just over here. I figured. Good. I'm like, she's on a I'm roll. Not... I can feel it. <laughs> Thank you. No, I was trying to say, um, Mary Frances, I was thinking about reflecting on your question. Um, you know, what is the percentage that it would take to run? Specific, what is what is the funding allocation percentage? And um, you know, I'm so passionate about this subject and I feel like it's disappointing to say, I don't know. And I think that's what I, we're trying to figure out bottom line, whatever we do, I do think we have to get away from the habit of trying to fund all things everywhere, unless the state legislature the governor's office are ready to put some serious money behind all the things everywhere right um and what i mean by that is you know i think about texas houston who decided that they were going to combine a um apartment availability with immediate sweeps right so they decided as part of their public space management program, but also their ending homelessness program, they were going to have folks who engaged in sweeps also say, hey, you have to move, but guess what? I have an apartment for you ready in this space, right? Um, as part of that process, the mayor explained that they decided to target a very specific group of people, chronically homeless, veterans of a certain I can't remember exactly what the what the thing was but it was a very specific population and said this is who we're going to serve this is where we're going to direct our money this is the strategy that we're going to push and when they brought all the players and the just a second people and just a second baby what? and what? and the stakeholders to the <laughs> to the table, they said, yeah. this is our focus, are you on board, right? Um, and then they put the money, they put some serious money behind it and they ran with it. In 10 years, I think it's what, 65%, they were able to lower their homelessness population. So I think, I do, th think about, I think it was Jill who asked the question, do we have any best practices on targeted universal universalism? I don't necessarily think that is an example of targeted universalism, but it is an example of what happens when we focus our investments on a particular strategy. And I think in, in Oregon, particularly, and especially in Multnomah County, like Alan, as you were talking, it just came up for me over and over and over again. We spread the peanut butter way too thin. And that that's a problem. I think that helps contribute to the cycle that Jennifer was talking about earlier, where we accidentally shoot ourselves in the foot by the way the system is designed. I know you were talking about something different, but you know, it's related. So yeah, that's just what's coming up for me. I don't know what that percentage is, but I do know that whatever we do and wherever this funding is going to go, we should try to be as focused as we can and really heavily invest in it to make it work, right? Like part of the reason why Housing First hasn't manifested the results that we'd like to see is because we throw pennies at it. <laughs> we don't do the wraparound supports to get somebody who's choosing recovery. We don't do the wraparound supports to make sure that there's a recovery bed if somebody needs to exit. We don't do the wraparound supports to make sure while that person is in that recovery bed, we're paying their rent so that they have an apartment to come back to, right? Like 
that requires a significant sum of money. That's what I'm thinking of as you answered your question, as you asked your question. I appreciate that, um, Katrina. I, I I'm going to invite Mike into the conversation. I, I know Mike, you've been at almost the same amount of subcommittee meetings I've attended and had a chance to talk to various task force members. Um, but you want to share some of your preliminary thoughts based on those conversations and what you're hearing? Yeah, for sure. And um, you know, I, just on the heels of Katrina's uh, excellent kind of analysis, there, I think it's super helpful. And um, I think like. Uh, I've, ha I've had a few different subcommittee conversations with folks um, and and kind of talked about a little bit of this framework. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess one historical context for this conversation I think is important. Um, Mary Francis and I were looking at a, a document uh, uh, from sort of early on in this uh, House Bill 2100 process that, that got to that percentage question, right? That 80, 20 percent split between community action and, and other organizations. And um, I think that was like really helpful at the time. And I, I think as we develop these conversations, one light bulb for me is that the question about percentages between different organizations and different types of organizations probably isn't the right question in some ways. Like, and I think y'all have been in sort of diving into these questions in a lot more substantive way um, that that I, I feel like we um, the framework that you know I've been thinking about and reflecting um, from your conversations is really like there's some key priorities that this group has that I think can be met by that concerted organized way of allocating resource right so um, I think one one key priority I've heard from many folks on the task force is investing in the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon. We recognized in our January report that there are serious disparities in uh, Native American, Alaskan Islander populations, and tribal governments are sovereign neighbors, and they do not have the same access to resources um, that that historically um, funded organizations have had. So that that's been something that I've heard loud and clear. And that is something we're doing now in a one-time appropriation. But that ongoing need um, is absolutely a critical piece of this. So I think like the the way I've been thinking about this in, is in terms of like a four uh, sort of pot, slice of pie framework. Um, and, and the tribes are really, um, you know, one piece of that. I think another piece of this um, uh, sort of equation is uh, getting resources out to local communities to design their interventions and systems at, 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 you know, sort of at the local level, but really making sure that we're not just equipping one organization with the responsibility for all the different voices, but that we need to make sure that we're funding um, local systems that are planful and thinking about the different needs across the um, their, their systems and really thinking about those best practices. Thinking about what you know their community can can mirror you know Houston or DC or other regions that are really like actually trying to solve the problems in, in their communities. Um, thinking about targeted universals and thinking about what those look like. So I think that that sort of second piece of pie in my mind is like where do we fund uh, local communities and in Oregon what does that look like? Typically, what that's historically looked like across the country is those continuums of care that we talk about, right? So continuums of care being able to be uh, the, the sort of conveyors for how to get resource and design systems and think about collaborating and bringing folks to the table. Um, obviously in rural Oregon, the rock, it's such a good example of like uh, some of the disparities we see in our, in our rural parts of our state. Um, we really need a different solution there. Um, luckily, we're seeing many different local communities across Oregon step into this leadership space and creating local planning groups, creating local um, collaboratives where they're actually getting together, creating strategies around how to end homelessness, how to decrease racial disparities. Um, I think those are opportunities for us to tap into and think about where uh, we could fund those local systems and really think about you know, resource going to local groups in that way. Um, I think there's still like a lot of questions about funding COCs as compared to funding community action agencies. Um, that I'm I, I'm really excited to dig into more with the group um, sort of pros and cons, but I think that's sort of a big piece of this equation is like we need organized, concerted ways of getting resources out um, that isn't just only relying on the, those organizations that know all the things 
um, and have all the connections and all the political capital to make the um, to, to get the resources first. Um, that's really where the next piece of pie comes in for me, and um, that's really funding that's really deployed intentionally that's reducing disparities, especially racial disparities in our systems. Um, and this is where like the the call for direct access to state resources. Um, for community-based organizations, culturally specific organizations, and other groups come in. Um, we, we know that like those organizations that maybe have never thought of themselves as homeless system organizations, they don't know what their COC is or even what a COC is. They need the outreach, the systems, the infrastructure. Um, you know, Alan, I also think about what you were saying about um, the, the needs for different interventions for certain populations like folks in recovery. Um, ha having resource that think that that's designed and tailored for folks that are needing unique interventions like that could also be a part of this other piece of pie, right? So like we're thinking about um, targeted universalism approaches. This could be a way where we're thinking about reducing, you know, homelessness overall and not just thinking about the disparities, but thinking about thriving, thinking about how to get people to really and um, uh, live the, the lives that they're wanting to live without the barriers for, that they're experiencing through all these dis uh, discriminatory systems and policies. So like those, um, those that approach and really creating a fund that is just for um, groups that are intentionally trying to think about the disparities or the, the access needs for historically um, uh, um, overrepresented groups in these systems, like that, that would be the whole intention of this. So really designing it for this group, for these populations, and really a flexible intervention. Like we know that sometimes these interventions and the data collection practices might look different because of the community's needs and the, the uh, you know, sort of diversity amongst um, different groups. So like really thinking about the flexibility we would wanna design into that. And then sort of the last fourth, fourth piece of pie is thinking about like our community action agencies and sort of the important role that they play across the state um, uh, already in terms of thinking about anti-poverty work and sort of the work that they do, especially through the Community Services Block Grant. Um, that's the federal fund that really uh, created community action agencies and it's sort of where our whole system is built on. Um, those community action agencies uh, could be supplied with resources that specifically uh, designed around their community services block grant funding and sort of the flexibility for those funds. Um, just for community action, uh, community action agencies. So instead of uh, uh, see, seeing them in this lens of uh, housing only, um, we broaden the opportunities for housing and homelessness support. Think about community services block grant as sort of a, a pathway for them to get resources um, formula funded to them like they've historically had through EHA and SHAP. So um, I think these are like some ideas that we wanted to sort of just float for the whole group that could be helpful um, for discussion and starting to, as you all start to think about exactly what, what levels of recommendations um, you all want to go for. And I think, you know, to echo Katrina's great thoughts before, like um, deciding on our priorities and deciding on sort of the interventions that we need to see in the systems that we're trying to build is really important. And I think what we're looking to you all for, um, you know, we're really eager to, to try to find um, solutions that are going to advance these goals and really make sure that we're thinking about the system needs as well as reducing disparities. Um, and I think some of these programs can help us accomplish those. So really, it's replacing some of these programs that we, you know, I, I just talked about with ones that are, um, you know, go, going uh, specifically to the community action agencies, and really designing the system anew in a lot of ways. Um, so I think that's sort of the big picture. I talked about it with some of you all, but um, I know there's there's missing pieces, there's components that we need to dig into and, and fix and tweak and talk about. So um, wanted to put that out there for folks to consider and um, uh, definitely th thank you, Mary Francis, for giving me a little space to do that too. Thanks for that, Mike. Um, I know we are getting close to time, but if there are any folks that want to share general like gut reactions or um, just you need time to process, I also understand that. That was a lot to receive in.
kind of reshare my screen now to talk through a couple of next steps and reminders. Um, first up here, just want to remind folks or inform folks of two things. One, the repository for recommendations is open and we haven't had any recommendations to date, which is totally fine. We are again synthesizing recommendations that have been uplifted um, or suggested at the subcommittee level. Um, we are going to finish our synthesis uh, no later than the 30th of this month, and we will email um, in a user-friendly format uh, those recommendations to each of you so that you have a few weeks to really absorb them, talk amongst one another outside of our um, formal task force meetings, and um, really sit with the recommendations. Um, kind of parallel to that, we are working on a report shell, um, so that's being drafted. We're going to go ahead and share the outline of the report that just gives you a sense of the non-recommendation content that you can look to see uh, in that report. Um, that will also be shared parallel to those recommendations um, that we have been able to synthesize, so I would ask if folks uh, come up with any ideas or suggestions or thoughts, please use that repository so we can make sure that we're receiving and recording information um, to present back out for you. Um, and we're going to spend some time, I have some to-dos around targeted universalism and some community examples um, at the February task force meeting, but would really love for folks to come prepared to that February meeting to both discuss and uh, vote uh, potentially at that February the 15th meeting. Um, of course, you all will have some subcommittee meetings in between there where you can have dialogue and ask for tweaks and um, things like that, but we really want folks to have the information at their fingertips to feel confident about voting for or against recommendations wherever you um, find yourself on that spectrum. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll need a full quorum for any potential voting, um, and we also want to be respectful of folks having access to the information uh, in advance uh, to, to sit with and discuss amongst internal networks uh, and things of that nature. Anything else coming up for anybody before we close out? We've got about three minutes. I would just ask in the email prior to the meeting where we're going to be voting, make it clear that that next meeting is going to be a meeting where folks will be voting and that if you're participating in this task force, we need you to show up so we can uh, do that voting. Thank you for dropping that uh, link in there as well. Gosh. So we will work on getting these materials out to you uh, to the full task force within the next week and also get them uh, posted on the task force website um, with only two minutes to spare. Happy Wednesday to each of you. Thanks so much for joining tonight and um, having some difficult conversations. Paula, you're on camera. Did you want to say something? No? OK. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much to each of you and um, hope you happy first like first week of legislation, legislative session week um, up there in Oregon. Uh, appreciate each of you. Have a great evening.